Welcome to St. Mary's Harefield's streamed service for Sunday the 16th of May, the Sunday after Ascension Day. Last Thursday was Ascension Day, 40 days after the resurrection of Jesus, when we remember his leaving the earth and returning to heaven. So one message of this season is for us to lift our eyes above the things around us. Our hope is placed in the God who sees things from above yet identifies with the world in all its glory and in all its shame. Francis Pott, back in 1861, wrote a hymn for the dedication of an organ in a church in Lancashire. It caught on because of the tune, written by his friend Edwin George Monk, who was organist at York Minster for a quarter of a century. So, Winchester Cathedral Choir will help us to lift our eyes above in this season of Ascension Tide to the God who is above the farthest mortal eye can scan. Let us pray. The collect for today, the Sunday after Ascension Day. Risen, ascended Lord, as we rejoice at your triumph, fill your church on earth with power and compassion, that all who are estranged by sin may find forgiveness and know your peace. To the glory of God the Father. Amen. We also pray, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. 
If you would like to get hold of a piece of bread, we're going to be sharing that later in the service. I'll let you know when. So our first Bible reading is from the Gospel of Luke. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. It's Luke chapter 24, verses 49 to 53. Jesus ascends into heaven. Jesus said, I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they stayed continually at the temple praising God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. The ascension of Jesus, his return to heaven after his earthly life, is celebrated as a great victory. So we sing victorious hymns and emphasise his achievements through the cross over sin and death and the lostness of people who can't find purpose in life. There is, however, a flip side to all of this. He would now be absent. His resurrection's appearances had come to an end. Yes, OK, it wouldn't be long before God's Holy Spirit would be poured out on the day of Pentecost, which is a week today. But this period of absence is where many people have found themselves getting stuck over the years and still today. The absence of somebody we love from our lives can be very difficult to come to terms with. Over the past 14 months, a number of people have lost loved ones, either due to COVID-19 or just during the period when normal funerals weren't possible and grieving couldn't be shared naturally with others. So a lot of grief has probably been internalised. It hasn't gone away. It hasn't been dealt with. It's a constant thorn in the flesh. It can keep welling up as one more thing that we haven't been able to sort in lockdown living. In terms of faith, it's easy to fall into an ascension tide kind of attitude. We don't really feel God's presence. We like the hymns, we kind of believe in their message, but we're not actually, if we're honest, in a good place emotionally, mentally, spiritually. How do the disciples cope with Jesus leaving them? Luke 24, verses 51 to 53. While Jesus was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. They accepted that what was happening in the bigger picture was a good thing, which actually made them joyful. They accepted that this period of parting from Jesus wasn't permanent. They stayed together, supporting each other, and focused on praising God at the temple in Jerusalem. God was not really absent from them. They believed it, and they lived it. Sadly, the temple area in Jerusalem today is not filled with God's praise. The Al-Aqsa Mosque in this location is the place where the latest outbreak of violence erupted. Pandemic life has been marked by absence, the absence of meeting with people in ways that we used to, the absence of being able to, to go somewhere and do anything, the absence of activities, of dates in the diary, of things to look forward to. The list goes on and on. But God can be found in the frustrations of life, as well as in its activity and its achievements. And as we are slowly and uncertainly Embracing a degree of proactivity, let's gain a deep appreciation of what it means to be together again and in finding purpose in doing as well as being. It's not one or the other, it's both and. Henri Nouon, the Dutch Catholic priest, who founded the large community where people embraced disability and supported people who were different in various ways, said a very interesting thing. He said, we don't think ourselves into a new way of living. Rather, we live ourselves into a new way of thinking. Can we do this? Can we, like those disciples of Jesus, 
live ourselves into a new way of thinking. As the opportunities arise, living differently, appreciatively, aware of greater things in ourselves and aware of God who is far from absent, a God who is more present to us than we probably are to ourselves. Charles Wesley, the great 18th century hymn writer, wrote hymns for particular occasions and seasons in the Christian church. His hymn for Ascension Tide was written in 1739. Some hymn books have changed his lyrics in places, but this version keeps Wesley's original wording. Hail the day that sees him rise, ravished from our wishful eyes. Christ a while to mortals given, reascends his native heaven. Alleluia. Today's second reading is from the Acts of the Apostles, which recounts the story of the early church. Acts chapter 1, verses 15 to 17 and 20 to 26. Matthias is chosen to replace Judas. 
In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, May his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us. Beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they nominated two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, so he was added to the eleven apostles. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A question. What is the value of a church meeting? This passage from Acts chapter 1 describes an early church meeting, maybe the first one. There's one item on the agenda, which the chairman, Peter, is raising. Membership. He says, we need to appoint someone to replace Judas Iscariot as one of the band of disciples, now called apostles, who are sent out. So he outlines the membership qualifications. It needs to be someone who's been around for a bit and has witnessed the ministry of Jesus from the beginning until his ascension into heaven. So two people are nominated. Verse 23, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Verses 24 and 25, then they pray. Well, that's got to be good. Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry which Judas left to go where he belongs. Verse 26, then they cast lots. Well, that's not what we tend to do in PCCs or APCMs or any church committees. We don't get out the dice to make our decisions. It's an interesting alternative to voting. And we're told the lot fell to Matthias. So he was added to the 11 apostles. Anyway, they sought their problem. Or do they? Was this really the problem in the first place? They just witnessed the ascension of Jesus into heaven. The first thing they organise is a committee meeting to make sure their list is up to date. The church needs to organise itself. We need to organise ourselves. Everything needs to be organised, otherwise nothing works. Nothing gets anywhere. But what we give our time and attention to needs to be something worth organising with fruitful results. There is some thinking that this Acts chapter 1 committee meeting is a bit of a twiddling of the thumbs, a bit of a, well, let's do something moment. Good for Matthias that he got himself on the board of directors, but we don't hear anything about him again. This decision doesn't seem to be earth shattering. And by the way, what happens to the one who didn't get in? Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice. Plenty of names, but no role. How did this make him feel, I wonder? The dice didn't roll in his favour. The Christian church in his history has been littered with people who have been hurt by having bad church experiences. We don't know whether Joseph shrugged the experience off or whether it finished him off as a follower. He may have been forced to be on the outside of the in crowd. St Mary's Church, like many others, is starting again after pandemic, after so much non-activity. It's wise for us to consider what are the things of fundamental importance that need to be addressed. The immediate can be the enemy of the important. The pull of the past can impede the progress of the present. As we begin to do things again, we need to remember the maxim, beware the barrenness of a busy life. The church is ultimately about people more than places. It's ultimately about God more than our own agendas and ideas. Christian life and fellowship is something that is caught, not taught. 
and allowed to develop naturally without being hyper-organised and artificially contained. The song, Jesus, Stand Among Us, comes from the contemporary hymn writer Graham Kendrick. It's a simple prayer for us to find Jesus to be present in Christian fellowship and at the breaking of the bread. It's a good reminder about what the church is really for and its benefit to all of us. Let us pray. We pray for the desperate situation in Israel and Gaza, for the victims of conflict and the increasing civilian casualties. We pray for a de-escalation of violence. Lord, help us to know your presence today. We pray for the work of the Royal British Legion as it celebrates a hundred years of service to members and veterans of the armed forces and their families and dependents. Lord, help us to know your presence today. We pray for the relaxation of lockdown measures that come into effect tomorrow. And we also pray for the worrying COVID-19 situation worldwide, especially in India, and how it might affect the UK's progress to freedom. Lord, help us to know your presence today. We pray for so many affected economically by lockdown as the iconic Debenham store now closes completely. Lord, help us to know your presence today. And we pray for the life of St. Mary's Church in Harefield, still restricted by the COVID measures in place. We pray for our annual general meeting today, that we might begin to move forward after a year of non-events. Lord, help us to know your presence today. We remember those who are ill and we pray for them. We pray for healing for Alistair and Sylvia McIntyre, Barbara Leake, Carol Gomez, Charles, Christopher Costard, John Butler, Lorian Brooker, Neil, Peter Clare, 
soon, and any others we know. And we pray for those who grieve for Paul Hutton, Joe May, and Gemma Sahi. Let us confess our sins to God. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The 19th century was the time of the so-called Oxford Movement in England. It was a time when some in the Church of England claimed a kind of lineal descent from the original apostolic church. As they pursued this, they studied the ancient history of the church, especially its liturgy. And in doing so, they discovered a wealth of Greek and Latin hymns from the earliest centuries of the Christian church. They gave new life to these hymns. One of the adherents of this movement, Matthew Bridges, started life as an Anglican, but took the path of John Henry Newman and became a Roman Catholic. Matthew Bridges began to write hymns, and the majestic hymn Crown Him With Many Crowns was one of them, an appropriate hymn to celebrate the victory and the reign of Jesus in this Ascension Tide season. Crown Him With Many Crowns.
as an expression of our fellowship together across the world and more locally, right down the ages and all over the place right now, why don't we share some bread together, a token of the basic constituent food of life that we all need to have and to eat, but we share together, praying for each other and feeling connected. I'm going to fetch my piece of bread. As we break the bread, we remember the world is still very broken and we pray that God would heal, that he would do so through the fellowship that we experience as believers and people working together for the better and greater common good. And as we share this bread together, we'll hear a tune on the flute. St. Mary's Church is open this coming week, uh, tomorrow Monday from 10 till 2, Wednesday from 10 till 4, and Saturday from 10 till 1. There's also a service on Wednesday at 10 a.m. in the Church Hall Chapel in the High Street. And next Sunday at St. Mary's Church, there'll be the usual 8 o'clock communion service and the 10.30 communion service afterwards. There'll also be, as usual, a service streamed next Sunday at 10.30. The Royal British Legion celebrated the centenary of its foundation yesterday. It was formed on the 15th of May 1921 by bringing together four different national organisations of ex-servicemen. And Field Marshal Earl Haig served as its president until, its death, until his death in 1928. Its aim was always from the word go to support survivors and their families who had fought initially in the First World War but were unable to look after themselves once the war had ended. The RBL, as it's known in short, organised the first ever poppy appeal on the 11th of November 1921. The poppies sold out almost immediately and raised over £106,000, a considerable amount at that particular time. A hundred years later, the Royal British Legion continues to provide practical, financial, social and emotional support to members and veterans of the armed forces, their families and their dependents. So as our local acknowledgement of the Legion's work, a wreath was laid yesterday at Harefields War Memorial. Another will be ded dedicated today at St Mary's Church in the service and laid on the obelisk in the Anzac Cemetery. Two wreaths laid locally to remember some great work that is continuing all over this land, helping people who need practical help as a result of being affected by war. We remember all those who suffer as a result of conflict today. We remember those who work so that the words of Captain Tom might ring true, so that tomorrow will be a good day. The hymn Fight the Good Fight reminds us that life is a battle for all of us, including those of us who have faith in God and follow Christ. It's still a battle. It was written by a 19th century Irish Anglican clergyman and poet, John Monsell. It's based on 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, where the Apostle Paul encourages Timothy in his oversight of the church in Ephesus, fight the good fight of the faith. The hymn urges us to fight the good fight, run the straight race, cast care aside and faint not nor fear. Fight the good fight.
we draw to the end of our service, there is an anonymous poem that reminds us of the important truth about the church. Well, an important truth, certainly, that there are no perfect churches. By the way, if we ever do find a perfect church, we shouldn't join it, because then it wouldn't be perfect anymore. No perfect church, author unknown. I think that I shall never see a church as all it ought to be, a church whose members never stray beyond the straight and narrow way, a church that has no empty pews where all the people pay their dues, a church whose members always sing and flock to church when bells do ring. Such perfect churches there may be, but none of them are known to me. But still we'll work and pray and plan to make our own the best we can. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shun upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. George Herbert was an interesting poet and a clergyman in the 17th century. He knew King James I. He was contemporary of Shakespeare and Milton. He wrote this short but powerful hymn where the world proclaims its God and King, but it's the deep faith of the heart that will bear the longest part. Let all the world in every corner sing, my God and King. <laughs>